Right, uh, I'm here with uh, Len Armand, and uh, I've taken this moment to uh, ask him to talk a little bit about teaching games for understanding. So, firstly, I'd just like to thank thank you, Len, for um, taking this moment out of the conference and uh, spending a few moments. And uh, I think it would be um, a good starting point would be to talk a little bit about the history of teaching games for understanding. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I had a room in Victory Hall at the university and I was going off to a meeting in Manchester to work with teachers. I came downstairs and in Victory Hall, Rod Thorpe was teaching net games to students. They were postgraduate people, people who had come to do a, had a, a non-physical education and exercise science background that came to do physical education as a second subject. So there were a lot of them very new to games. And Rod thought was teaching them games, and I was fascinated by what they were doing. And uh, so I spent about an hour and a half and got to Manchester late, um, talking to Rod, and I said, why are you doing all this? So he explained why he was doing it. So I said, right, we must have a meeting, right, and discuss this. Mm. So we did. Right. Uh, came back, uh, talked to him at length, and explained why he was doing it, essentially because he was unhappy with the way that people were learning games, it was all technique-based, drill-based stuff, and it simply wasn't working. Uh, and his argument was that lots of children, young people, were getting not a good experience of games, and they certainly couldn't understand it. Right. Uh, so I began to think about this, and um, he had only done that in net, net games, badminton and tennis. He was applying the same principles across from tennis to badminton. That's what I was interested in and how we broke it down into much smaller games for them to play. So we discussed it in greater detail, and over a period of time, we began, it began to emerge as a, a curriculum opportunity, because I've been working with teachers in Leicestershire, and I wanted them to reflect, I want them to, to be involved in the reflecting process, rethink how, what they were doing, how they were doing it. And one of the best examples I can get, a guy called Mike McNeil was in Singapore. Mike McNeil was now in Singapore right. and a big advocate of teaching games for understanding. He was one of the people in the group and he said, Len, when you, you've got me thinking now, he says, before I used to make an active decision just like that, now I stop and think and I'm not sure I'm making the right decision. So that was quite an important thing. But the, he was one of the few teachers who would pick up the idea of reflection on practice. Right, the others weren't. So I thought, why are they not doing that? And I thought, right, I know the answer to this. We must get something they're desperately keen on, games. And because it was presenting something different, I thought, right, let's pursue the notion of teaching games. How can you develop your own practice? How can you learn about games? How can you improve the practice for children in the, your school? And that was a starting point. So I stimulated Rod, I'm sorry, we discussed and argued. So at that point, there was no theory whatsoever. Right? No theory. All there was was a practical response to a problem, and he was solving it in a very interesting way. So I sat down. I'd, I'd come from a um, master's degree, working at Maidley College, working on a programme called Man of Course of Study, mm -hmm. and working with Jerome Bruner there, and a guy called Lauren Stenhouse, who were all into reflection on practice. And Man of Course of Study was probably the best curriculum program that has ever been invented or devised. It was superb, absolutely superb. And so I was influenced by that, and I was looking at what Rod was doing, and I was saying, OK, Bruner's Theory of Instruction talks about how do you represent a complex idea into a simple form. So I said, let's start off then, Rod. What you seem to have done is taken the game, and you have looked at a number of simplified games that enable a person to lead up to the complex game. So what you've done, you've represented games in a certain way. I said, what's about the progression? So we began talking about progression because in Bruner's notion, you develop a structure which enables you to progress and develop in the theory of instruction. So we began to, to, const to start thinking about how do you represent the game in its simplest form of way, right? And how do you initiate a developmental process? Because what Rob was doing at the time was simply playing smaller games, which were getting them excited about games, and they were learning a lot. Mm -hmm. So we began to think then, OK, let's devise the most simple game as possible, right, and how do we move on? Look, 
How do you organise these games? What's the organising principle? Another concept of Bruno, a guy called Orzabal as well. So we began to have the concept called exaggeration. How do you exaggerate the simple game so the kids can understand it? They don't have to play it with a racket. So we took badminton as an example and we devised the idea of long and short. So if a person is at the back of the court, then all you have to do is to put the shuttlecock just over the, the net. And if they're at the net, you put it right over the head and go, right? And uh, so we, we, we looked at that and we looked at the whole notion of making a court wide and things like that. And so Rod began to focus his thinking and his ideas round how you develop these simpler forms. So there was an interaction really between both of us, me bringing a theory from Bruner and Man, of course, a study, right? And um, him with his practical understanding. And that's very important. Today, many kids, many teachers, sorry, do not have an incredible experience of a wide range of games. They, they tend to specialise and don't maybe two. But at Loughborough, everybody, they had an incredible intramural programme. Mm -hmm. So they had about 47 different activities that students could take part in over the whole of the year in different sports. And many students use this informal learning to have an experience of five, six, seven, eight sports. Because it was part of the done thing, you took part in them. Right. So it was a tremendous learning experience. So, and Rod and David had both been through that. And they had an incredible understanding of games. And they could see similarities and differences. Right. So that was another aspect. So we used this notion of representation. How do you exaggerate? Right. And then we began to think, well... Somebody posed the question, OK, what happens if I can't hold a racket? And Margaret Ellis was there at the time, and so from Canada, and uh, she'd be doing this work on modification. So we began to talk about modification, the principles of modification, how can you change it? And we came up with a concept, OK, modification is about reducing the demands of the activity. So how can I teach a game to somebody that has no technical competence? Oh, it's simple. You don't use a racket, you use a ball. So we played simple games where you use, you throw the ball, right, still using the long and short concept. Mm -hmm. So they began to understand what the game is all about. Because if you ever see somebody starting to play badminton, they always cooperate, hit it to each other. When the game is about putting it where they can't get right. it. That spoils the game if you do that, going to the kids. So we had to make it an interesting challenge to them. So long and short became possible. So we can use a large ball, it's easy to catch, you can throw it high and it gives you more time to catch. So we could modify the demands of the game if somebody could not hit a shuttlecock or anything like that. And then we moved from that to a, a, maybe a smaller ball that was a bit faster. Then we introduced the idea of just using it with your hands with a softer ball. Then we brought in a massive big racket because we were surprised at the time. People were modifying equipment and this guy came in with the Hockey Association trying to sell it to Loughborough, saying, look at this beautiful stick. You can get kids of six playing. And it was tiny, and the head was tiny. Right. And we always said, that's stupid. You know, you can't do that. You're making the day game more difficult. Why don't you make a great big head? What? That's not the game of hockey. You know. right. But that was exactly what you should do. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And um, one of the things that Rod would do in badminton, he'd pose a question to all the students. Right, if you want to make this game simpler, what do you do with the net? You lower it. OK, let's play it. Try it. So they all played it. But they couldn't play it because the ball was speeded up <laughs> with it on a low. So we said, OK, what else we could do? Well, we'll make it higher. So they made it higher, and of course, he gave them time. Oh, so your little Eureka moment was there. Oh, I see. I see why that can happen. So students began to understand, and students began to, uh, kids began to understand much more about the game itself. And therefore, they practiced more. And as they practice more, they can become more skillful. And that's an interesting discussion point, really, because everybody thinks teaching games understanding is about tactics, and you're not bothered about skill. We were trying to change games in such a way that kids could become more skillful. Right. right? That was what we were trying to do. So they have more practice, uh, and, uh, but that's been lost. So, you know, it's mm. interesting. It's never really been said, really, like that. That was very important. So I then began to say, OK, we've done it all practically. Let's put a theoretical structure to it. OK. So I 
I was, I'd done my master's degree in philosophy, and I was interested in a guy called Bernard Soups, who wrote a book called The Grasshopper. And he said, what is a game? A game is about problems, right? Stupid problems in some cases. And one of the examples he uses, how stupid is a game where you get a long stick, right, with a tiny ball, and you ask somebody to put that ball into a hole 300 yards away. <laughs> now, who would invent a long stick? There must be better ways of doing it. <laughs> Why don't you kick it, you know, things like that. So they are problems. Games present problems in a different sort of way that attract a lot of attention and people are absorbed by the whole way of playing it. So Bernard suits that, and I thought, hmm, yeah. So I like that idea. So games is a problem solving, no, it's a problem posing activity, not problem solving. So in other words, it poses problems where the solutions are the absorbing interest. Okay. So that was the first starting point. So yeah. I was, Rob was developing his practical ideas, I was developing the theory. So I use Bernard's suit. So a game is a problem-solving activity. So what we have got to do is to present different problems to children in such a way they learn the game. And that matches very well with the work we were doing on long and short and things like that. And then I began to think, well, there are what I term the word primary rules. And uh, primary rules in terms, uh, he didn't use the word that in suits, it was my use of the word. He talked about rules which specified exactly what the game is. If you change those rules, it becomes a totally different game. So I call them primary rules, mm -hmm. right? And that makes a game a distinctive way of playing, right? And then he used the word regulative rules, which is absolutely fine. So I simply coined the term secondary rules. Secondary rules are rules that you can change in order to improve the playing of the game and the experience. Well, he'd used the word regulation. Uh, so I thought, I thought it was more important to talk about secondary rules in how can you change the rules to make the game more important to a person, uh, a better experience, and it gets rid of all the anomalies and things like that. So primary and secondary rules is written down. And then because of this uniqueness of games and primary rules, I then went into a classification process. So we then decided that games, there were different sorts of games. And with Rod and Dave, and we'd, by this stage, we developed a lot of critical friends right, who were interested in doing the same sort of thing and challenging and trying the ideas out, uh, all, all in very high-level sport, all high-level in terms of playing international sport. So it was fascinating because they knew the games really well. Mm. And they were all in universities. And um, so we began to look at uh, the... Uh, you know, all these different concepts. So we began to think that, hang on, invasion games are the most difficult. And we're talking about complexity. Why don't we say, then, that we should ha look at the different sorts of complexity in terms of playing the game. Are there some more simple than others? So I simply devised target games, net wall games, striking fielding games, invasion, in terms of that moving from simple to complex, which is another Brunerian concept. How do you move from simple to the complex? Mm -hmm. So it was that classification of games which is stuck in a way. So we simply use it and said, really, the first game children should learn are, are, in, are target games. And then you start using um, games like net and, and uh, war games, um, obviously moving on. And then we began to look at the differences. How do you solve the problems? How do you work them out? And we said, well, in, in essence, it's about it's about the tactics, knowing what the principles of play are. And Rod and Dave had come from the FA, who were working on similar sorts of concepts in terms of football. Right, so they were coming from that background. And so we said, right, it's about the principles of play. We weren't thinking of tactics at the time, because tactics was a different sort of thing. Principles of play are, what are the key moments in a game? You know, how can we replicate these in key moments right. of a game? Right, so we began to talk about principles, and then I, I looked again at Bernard's suits and the problems, and I began to think, well, you have to use strategies and you have to use tactics, as simple as that. So the principles of play, right, are ways in which you can develop the tactics of a game to solve the problems and make one more interesting, and so you can also win, because part of the whole process is, by all means, play and enjoy playing. But we're talking about competition, right? So why not see it as... We have to solve the problem and win the game. So tactics became part of the thing. 
and we began to use the word, we didn't use the word tactic, we said, how can we devise games which illustrate all the principles of play and at the same time the very essence of the game? Right. So that's, in a sense, where we came from in terms of practical ideas, theoretical constructs which helped us to formulate a movie in a certain way. So what you had, in, in a sense, is the 1986 paper in Oregon where we presented the concept of representation, exaggeration, and modification. Right? So that is the real model of teaching games for understanding, not the model that Rod, Rod and Dave, after we had a, a seminar a discussion with about eight other people, and we've been thinking, well, well, how do you move from this notion of kids not being able to play, right? How do you, them, how do you get them to be able to play? So they developed that model as a kind of a thinking process Right. right, but it was never a model for teaching games, which has been picked up by everybody. So that that's quite an important point, isn't it? So the, the essence, of what you're just saying there, is that what everyone knows the teaching games for understanding model, the, the circular diagram, and is not the essence of the model. No. It's not the model. It's not the model. No. Never so, has been. So that's quite an important point. The the information you've covered so far about exaggeration, representation. And the modification, modification of games are the key, the key things Absolutely. that people have to focus in on. Yeah, and I think they've been missed. You know, over the years, those those things have been missed in a great detail. And the other, <clears throat> the other side of that was David Kurt was at Loughborough at the time because he was my PhD student, and I was interested. In, and we'd, we'd use the word teaching games, and we played around with lots of terms. And I think all of us came to a conclusion. It wasn't one person. I think all of us said, "Well, what we're trying to do is to get." people to understand the game, understand the game so they can play it better and enjoy it. Understand the game, as Rod talked about squash, he'd been to a squash tournament and uh, a lot of people were watching and he started talking to them and he was saying, why a person playing like that? Why? I don't know. And he said, people are watching and playing, but the actual fact, they're not making sense of the game. Right. So why don't we use this and let's try to get people to understand the game better so when they watch a game on television, they can actually analyse it and see why things are being done. And we set students um, things to do, like, for example, um, uh, watching an Aussie rules football. Okay. Tell us what the principles of play are, and, uh, you know, how to get better, what you do on this. And it's a fascinating experiment taking different games. I was watching Gaelic football yesterday and I was trying to make sense of it. And, and I thought, hmm, I thought at first it was like Aussie oh, rules football. No, it's not. No, it's not. No. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> there are some concepts there because I think they've, they've, they've uh, taken people over and played different games in terms of Gaelic and Australian games. And, um, but there's massive differences. But it was actually more complex than I thought. I think I'm out, of, I'm out of touch at the moment. I have to get back to this. But it's a useful exercise to get students. I mean, people who have never played American football, when I ask them to analyse a game mm -hmm. in groups, is a really useful experience. Anyway, you know, I've covered a long period there because there, there were two phases. The first phase was me meeting Rod Thorpe in 77 and then developing theoretical perspectives on it. Me going to, to uh, New Zealand right and uh, working on uh, still working on the theory uh, influenced by Rod and Dave what, not Rod in particular but what they'd done so I began to try those ideas out in New Zealand but it wasn't getting anywhere it wasn't getting anywhere at all it was almost as if I was talking a different language mm. and I, I, I made a fatal mistake of talking about rugby <laughs> right which was so. We know more about rugby than you do. Yeah, yeah I agree, but... <laughs> so I think that probably hindered it a little bit. And I think also I was trying out, trying out in my own mind, how can I explain this to people? Right. So that was an interesting thing. So when I came back to England, right, in 1980, and went back straight back to was, was then Loughborough University then, we picked it up with Rod. I said, we are going to publish this. The only way you will get any, make any sense if you publish it so I published the, in the bulletin in 1982. That's why next year is the 30th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And basically the idea was, if it's on paper, people can read it, they can ask questions, and we can develop the idea and, and people can... And it worked, because people began to be interested and thinking, this is different. Right, so so that, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because it's worth pointing out that uh, you came to New Zealand, and I have to point out to some of my students that's from the first time I met you, 
And but that then, was also the first time I spoke in public so about it. So that was it. the first time that you spoke about teaching games for understanding. 1979, 1979. in New Zealand. And then, so you went back, and then it's that famous paper in... 82. 1982. Yeah. Because at that, that, that time, I got all my ideas, in a way, were there. So I was simply challenging Rod and Dave and putting the ideas on top, like a template, on top of all the games that were being developed. And I was pushing them hard to Dave about, come on Dave, mm. why don't you start thinking about fielding games, because that's your cricket, sure. So I began to think about it, and then he started to put it into his course. Then we started summer schools, and Alan Launder came over in 83, and that was really exciting, because he got people coming who knew games well, who could challenge us, and that's why we had loads of, I mean, we must have been working from 7.30 in the morning to about midnight every yeah. day, always tossing that. So the summer school was brilliant, getting right. lots of different people. So once again, for, uh, for some of our students, Ellen Launder um, went on to publish a book called Play, Play Practice, Practice. Yeah. and uh, that's very strong in Australia. So with, once again, some very good ideas in that. So that's interesting. So he came across, and it was that ability to, to discuss and challenge and extend those ideas. Yeah, I mean, I, I know now and before, because I, I met him when I went over to Australia from New Zealand, right? And I, I did not know at the time, because I was very keen on athletics, and of course he was in England at the time, and there was a thing called the Kangaroo Club, right? And there was a, a jumping competition. So in the winter, all schools competed on a ladder. So you put your kids' results for 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 on high jump, long jump, triple jump, uh, and things like that, and there were a few other things as well. You sent them in to Alan, right, and this other fe fellow, I forgot his name now, um, and uh, they published the results, right, so you could, could see. Therefore, there, there was my school competing against our school, our school winning everything, right, <laughs> <laughs> you know, things like that. So he had an interest in athletics. So when I went to Australia, I, I sought him out, right, and we had long discussions. But the key thing is, I applied the principles that I've been working on at TGFU to a concept called athletic challenges, which is the best way of putting it is in my book, you know, on physical education in schools. Yeah. I've got a copy there, if you haven't seen it, I'll show you. And um, so I applied the whole concept to track and field athletics. Mm -hmm. So in actual fact, we devised a completely new curriculum. Right? In actual fact, what is interesting is New Zealand sent over some of their coaches over to Loughborough to try all the ideas out. Right. So it was fascinating. <laughs> so teaching games for understanding has spawned a lot of things. Right? But 1982 onwards was intriguing because we were getting lots of requests to do presentations. And Rod insisted he would not do a lecture. No way. Right? I will do a practical session. So some local authorities who had advisors at the time would be really awkward. Right? So I remember one in Derbyshire, and he gave Rod a class of 45 kids who had never played badminton in their life, mm -hmm. right, and said, show us how you do it. And he was brilliant. Rod, he is a fantastic teacher, right. He immediately just got them playing with a ball over a net, just watching them, and then he said, move to the left, move to the right, move them out. And he got them all in ability groups by just simply playing with the ball. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then he introduced them to other things. And then he got them into a racket. So he went through a whole range of different things using different equipment, right? And then he would set each group a task, right, mm -hmm. to play a game, the long and short game. And he moved down, and he would be interjecting. And this is one of the things you see people teaching. And you see a teacher standing back and looking. And we, we use the expression facilitating and focusing. So Rod will be up and down, facilitating and changing that, focusing on something and coming back to it. And I can remember, I think the video is still available actually, I must try and find out. Uh, he, was, he was facilitating that change with low ability, giving them a focus, they're moving up to there to the top ones and keep changing up and down. And the advisor had her mouth open all the time. Mm -hmm. I have never seen anything like this, mm -hmm. and it was tremendous. So he was modifying equipment, he was showing how the principles could be played with people who could never play badminton in their life. It was a fantastic experience, and that was replicated all over the place. Um, and then, in 1983, I had uh, a guy called Terry Williamson, and then people in Coventry, and a place in Suffolk as well. And we decided to have three research projects. Right, so I, w I would go in 
we'd do three days of training with all the, t all the teachers, and then we'd want the teachers to go back and research their own practice. So it was an action research-based project in 83 with these, and that was really important. I mean, I did publish one with Rod, one article, and there's three articles on it. And what we were trying to do was to see if teachers could do research on their own practice, and they found it hard. Mm. One, they didn't have time, they didn't have the skills, it was something that was kind of alien to them. I, but if, if I do action research, I can't spend time with the kids or preparing. So it was a real issue. But the most interesting thing at the end of all three projects was that the teachers said they'd learnt more about games than they had ever learnt in their life. Mm. Right, that was one. And secondly, they began to understand their children more in the class, which is really fantastic. But I can remember a situation in Wirral when we had, a, must have been about 250 teachers all doing games in these two games halls. Right? And we gave them a simple, very simple game. You've got a tart, you've got a, a skittle there and a skittle there. Right? The aim of the game is to knock that skittle over and knock that skittle over. Simple, right? Mm -hmm. Simple game. So we put these people in and one group was... There were five international netball players in that, in that particular area. Right. And they went to them and went, shh, 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 shh. it was all technical stuff and fast and everything like that. And, and I, said, I stopped them and said, hang on a bit, you haven't scored a point yet, you haven't scored anything. What is the best way of stopping a person play, getting a point and, so, and, and they're going to score it? Oh, right. And they, they thought about it and they had no solution. I said, well, the best way is your team just surrounds the whole game, surrounds that point, and no one's got to score. Right. Oh, yeah. I said, and what's wrong with that? It's boring. You don't make any progress. Okay, then, what can you do to make it more interesting and exciting? So we began to move people through simplified games. So that was a game, and then you'd move on to a game with a bigger circle. Right? And then we devised a game, which was based on, if I use this as an example, based on just a flat area like that. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea was you had to touch the wall, it was this was in Victory Hall, touch the wall and you scored a point. So we started off and you can throw it anywhere, backwards, forwards, whatever you want to do. And they started playing, but they were playing all the time. There were no points scored. So I intervened and said to one team, uh, just uh, American football, what need, where's wide receivers? Oh, yeah, well, why don't you go and put one over there on the wall, one over there on the wall? Right? scored points. Immediately started scoring. The other side twigged it right away. So the game changed and then began to understand it. And so we began to move from that particular game to then changing the rules, right, so that um, we can bring out different principles. So we can bring out the notion of, you know, passing it forward, we got the notion of depth and width, where it began to introduce, keeping possession, we could use that simple game, move people through it, right, to teach all the principles of play in right. one simple way, right, by just changing the rule and changing what you could do with the, with the ball and not, right. And that's a simple one. So we used, we used lots of those. And the point was we were trying to get people to understand because those netball ga girls, excellent players who were, they hadn't actually understood what the game was about. They were just going to enjoy the game. So it was passing and going quick. They actually didn't understand about the, def the position of that. How do you stop them scoring? How do you create it? So we devised a series of games like that in invasion, uh, net fielding, net and wall games, fielding games and target games, so that we could help people to understand what was happening. Okay. And that was, that was a very, very important period. And because they were doing the research project, they could then begin to see why we were doing it because they were understanding games more themselves, which they hadn't. Nobody had ever taught them this. Nobody had ever taught them. Okay. All right, so that, that's a, um, a lovely point to, to sort of ask another question, which is um, you've given us a wonderful overview of both the history and some of the core concepts involved. Um, when you look at the contemporary use in teachers and schools today, uh, what are your thoughts about their use of games for understanding and its, its uptake or, or non-uptake in schools? I wish, I wish we had presented what we did in those early days. We actually documented it like on you know, video mm. and all things like that because I think people are missing out on that. They've been introduced to concepts 
at a much higher level without having had the other basic understanding. And I think secondly, um, that many students today, like I iterated earlier, do not have a comprehensive depth of experience in a wide variety of games. Right. They haven't played them enough, and they don't understand them. If you don't understand them, you can't develop practices. You can't develop progressive practices. Neither can you facilitate and focus on what children should concentrate on. It's not a formulaic approach, right? And too many people want a formulaic approach, just do this, just do that. And that's one problem in, in the present approach. And I think what we need to do, that's why I'm working now on this notion of, of practicing and getting people to start thinking much more about how you engage students. Right. And if I had to wave a magic wand, I want them to go back to the original concept so they really understand the game and then get them to play more about it so they get the feel for the game, right? learn more games and then get them to start thinking about how you develop progression. And at the same time, have a resource bank that they can match their understanding with what to do. Right? If you have a resource bank, you just pick and choose, you actually don't understand games. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is playing about with it. Right, and there's no concept, because I think the main problem is there's no progressive concept development of games. And that is the structure of lessons. So in England, people operate with six-week blocks. Six weeks blocks are stupid. Mm -hmm. It's the one major barrier, because I, I did a PhD viva the other week, over the month, and, and this was the big thing that came out. They were trying to teach the concepts of health-related exercise to students in six weeks, and they do it again next year. Well, where is the progressive development of understanding? Right. right. You know, how do you actually develop that? So I think the nature of how schools are organised does not stimulate that approach. So what we began to think about in those days was, OK, if you're using six weeks approach, use a six weeks appro approach to teach various things, but have intramural programmes throughout the year which allow children to get more practice. And we had ideas. I mean, Alan Launders... 1982 concept, we're discussing it, and he said, and we're in Victory Hall, and he said, let's devise, let's devise games, let's devise ideas where you can imagine and play. Now, in neuroscience, this is talking about 82, in neuroscience, they now say that is a major aspect of the learning process. We didn't know that in 82. The, the, it was the Alan's notion of imagination. I, yeah. I mean, imagining and... and because it, Alan, Alan took the point, he said, look, um, when I was a kid, right, I'd play tennis, and I would imagine I was playing against, you know, um, McEn not McEn uh, McEnroe, right. right, and playing against him, right, or a certain place, and I'd play on the wall, and I'd have a fantasy game about how I could beat him, right? So we developed that idea. We played lots of different fantasy games to get kids playing and understanding, right? And I think that was a really important development. It's not really being developed. Alan's doing it in play practice in the second edition, in a really nice sort of way. But I think that it, that fits in well to my concept of, of kids practicing on their own. Right. How can we develop strategies to get kids practiced on their own? So we can use the six point as a stimulus, six week block as a stimulus, but supplement it with intramural games kids could take part in, and also practicing, so they're doing things on their own, right, and introducing every so often, like for example, a competition for fantasy games. You tell me about your fantasy game, let's play it. Right. Right. And the other big thing was, let's get the notion of games making, where children invent their, and develop their own games, because that can make a link with a six-week block on an invasion game. So you've got a six-week block on an invasion game, you've got kids practicing on their own, you've got intramural programs, and you've got games making in between. So I was trying to get round the problems of what's happening in schools by doing that. I don't think people are solving that at the moment. I think it's a block of work on tactical games teaching and then left. And I don't think teachers know enough about games. And third, they haven't gone back to the basics, what we will be understanding. Right. Does that make sense? It does, yes. So it, it's, especially within that, that, that title, Teaching Games for Understanding. So teachers need to think about what they mean by or what, what they're after in terms of understanding the game. Understanding is a key. That's why I don't like tactical games things and all the other titles are there, because the key word for me is understanding. If you understand the game, not on a, a, a theoretical level, right, because, I mean, I could, I could know everything about football, right, and, I, and there was a guy I met 
who could tell me all things about tactics. He had never played football in his life. He knew all about it. All right. But would he be able to apply that in a game situation? No, he, could. he would never be able to do it. Yeah. So you can, you can acquire an, an understanding from a theoretical point of view, but we want understanding in terms of practical as well as understanding the why. Right, of why you're playing games. Excellent. All right. Well, then I'd like to thank you very much for taking this time out right. and, and talk to us. That's been uh, wonderful, and it's a wonderful <laughs> insight into the, the early origins of teaching games for understanding and, and also your own philosophy and thinking about where um, teaching games for understanding is today. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. My pleasure.